Thomas Aquinas distinguishes between two kinds of divine truths. The first are those knowable through natural reason, such as that God exists, that he is one, eternal, infinite, etc. The second are those truths which are above human reason and thus only knowable through special revelation, such as that God is a trinity and that he became incarnate. The former are philosophically demonstrable, that is, their truth can be deduced necessarily from evidently true premises, whereas the latter cannot. Truths being above reason does not mean that they are illogical or that we cannot understand them, but rather only that they cannot be deduced from natural revelation. Those truths knowable through natural reason were known to the pagan philosophers, though imperfectly as their works contain many errors. However, God, in his wisdom, did not leave his existence solely to human inquiry, but instead revealed his existence through special revelation given by the prophets. He did this as due to the noetic effects of sin, laziness, stupidity, and human limitations, the vast majority of men would not seek out the truth of his existence, and those who did would do so slowly and with much error mingled in. This being so, even though God's existence is not, properly speaking, an article of faith for Aquinas, as he believes it to be a scientifically demonstrable truth, men can still treat it as one if they do not have the time or intellect to study the arguments for God's existence. One objection to natural theology is that if we do not know the divine essence, that is, what God is, how can we prove that he is, as proving the existence of something presupposes a knowledge of what it is? Aquinas, who is committed to the view that we cannot know what God is, only what he is not, responds by distinguishing between two kinds of demonstration, from cause to effect, and from effect to cause, the first of which presupposes a knowledge of the cause, whereas the latter does not. An example of a demonstration from an effect to a cause is being unable to open a door due to something being on the other side. One knows that something is on the other side, but not what it is. This is how Aquinas understands a demonstration of God's existence. Truths above reason, on the other hand, are not demonstrable and so are believed on faith for all Christians. These truths, such as the Trinity, can only be argued for probabilistically. Aquinas says, that God has given us fitting arguments to confirm the truth of scripture, such as the wonderful curing of illnesses, the raising of the dead, and other miracles contained within the Bible, as well as the inspiration of the unlearned and simple apostles, which allowed them to produce the most eloquent and divine scriptures which they penned. However, the greatest proof of the Christian religion is the wonderful conversion of the world to our faith. Aquinas says it would be more incredible than the miracles they performed if the apostles had managed to lie and convince the world of the divinity of their religion without divine aid. He contrasts this with the faith of Muhammad, which teaches man nothing of God which could not be known through natural reason, as well as much that is false. Its signs of authenticity, such as military conquest, are open even to bandits and robbers, and pale in comparison to the miraculous confirmation of the Christian faith. It lures men in with promises of carnal pleasure, whereas Christianity demands self-denial. In this faith, there are truths preached that surpass every human intellect, the pleasures of the flesh are curbed, and it is taught that the things of the world should be spurned. In Aquinas' view, the job of the Christian apologist is to establish those divine truths which are open to human reason by demonstrating the existence of God to the heathen, and to defend those truths which are above human reason by rebutting objections to them from Jews and Muslims, while presenting probabilistic but not demonstrative arguments for their truth. As we must not attempt to prove what is of faith, except by authority alone to those who receive the authority, while as regards others it suffices to prove that what faith teaches is not impossible. Richard Baxter, an English Puritan, accepted Aquinas' distinction between two kinds of divine truth, saying that those truths knowable through human reason were revealed in the book of nature, while those truths above human reason were contained explicitly only in the book of scripture. He compared the books to a lesser and greater light, teaching that once we see the light of the book of scripture, we will also be able to see the divine truths more clearly in the book of nature. After starting with the easier book of scripture, the believer should address yourself cheerfully to the study of the book of nature, that you may there see the creatures themselves as your letters and their order as the composure of syllables, words, and sentences, and God as the subject matter of all. This understanding of the books of nature and scripture as two overlapping lights, one brighter than the other, led Baxter to the belief that when our studies in the more obscure book of nature led to conclusions which contradict the clear book of scripture, they must be rejected. A prime example of this was the Cartesian rejection of substantial forms, which Baxter, along with the Dutch Reformed, took to be a rejection of mosaic physics, as they argued that the kinds mentioned in Genesis were equivalent to the concept of substantial form. This theological argument was buttressed by philosophical arguments about individuation and motion which he believed required the existence of substantial forms. 
Baxter, however, was careful not to make theological debates out of what he viewed as exclusively scientific questions, such as when he disagreed with the view of many Reformed that heliocentrism was contrary to scripture, saying that scripture was no rule for astronomy and other arts. The divine existence and attributes were not the only thing which Baxter believed scripture allowed us to see more clearly in nature. Following the patristic and scholastic tradition before him, he believed that once the Trinity had been revealed through special revelation, the believer was able to see the various trinities of nature imprinted throughout God's creation. In response to the question, is there a trace of the Trinity in created things and in the image of God in humanity, he says, so almost all the fathers thought, especially Augustine, Lombard, and Aquinas in the Summa, where he shows that the natural image of God is in all things, the holy image is in the saints, and the glorious image is in the glorified. Yet the image of the Trinity is only in the mind, but in the same way a trace is in the lower faculties and other creatures, and so there is no need to count almost all the interpreters of Master Lombard and to cite words or pages. One important passage for seeing the Trinity in creation was Romans 11.36, of which Baxter says, God's causal relations to his creatures are in general those named by St. Paul, of him and through him and to him are all things. And this is the first efficient, the supreme dirigent, and the ultimate final cause of all things. With Aquinas going further in appropriating the efficient cause of all things to the Father, the formal cause to the Son, and the final cause to the Holy Spirit. Baxter emphasized the trace of the Trinity in all created things as opposed to restricting it to the traditional memory, understanding, and will of man. He also deviated from the Thomistic understanding of efficient, formal, material, and final causality by collapsing the formal and material causes into what he called a constitutive cause, thus making Aristotelian causality threefold as to better reflect the Trinity. However, he did not believe that the Trinity could be demonstrated from the Book of Nature alone. When asked in one of his apologetical works, will you pretend to prove the Trinity by natural reason, he responds, it is one thing to prove the sacred trinity of persons by such reason, or to undertake fully to open the mystery, and it is another thing to prove that the doctrine is neither incredible nor unlikely to be true, and that it implieth no contradiction or discordancy, but rather seemeth very congruous both to the frame of nature and of certain moral verities. This only is my task against the infidel. It is one thing to show in the creatures a clear demonstration of this trinity of persons by showing an effect that fully answereth it, and another thing to show such a trace or image of it as hath those dissimilitudes which must be allowed in any created image of God. This is it which I am to do. Baxter also discusses, at length, the noetic effects of sin and the inclination of fallen man towards a rejection of spiritual truths, saying, the corrupt nature of man is more prone to question the truths of God's word than to see and confess their own ignorance and incapacity, and ready to doubt whether the things that Christ revealeth are true, when they themselves do not know the nature, cause, and reason of them. Following Aquinas, he states that man is more able to understand that a thing is rather than what it is. We must first understand that a thing exists before we try and grasp its nature. However, fallen man has a tendency to begin at the wrong end of the book by asking other questions prior to that concerning a thing's existence. Baxter laments the stupidity of the heathen who reject the existence of the soul as they cannot grasp its nature, or who reject the existence of God as they do not understand his essence, comparing them to a dog who rejects the existence of his master due to not understanding the nature of humanity. He rebukes also those who reject revealed truths due to not understanding their purpose, saying, This folly of man's heart doth discover itself thus, in that men will not believe the truths revealed by God because they cannot see God's ends and reasons and the use of the things. Many an evident truth is rejected by the proud wit of foolish man because God hath not told them why he hath so determined and ordered the business. Or if he have told it, yet they understand it not. So many infidels and Sicinians do deny Christ's satisfaction as a ransom and sacrifice for sin because they cannot see any reason for it or necessity of it. They say that God may pardon sin without satisfaction. And then what need of all this trouble? Or what likelihood that God would lay so much on his son or make so great a business of this work for our good and his glory if all was needless? And thus many deny the universal extent of his satisfaction as being for all mankind because they are not able to see the reason and use of it. They thrust in their vain reasonings as a sufficient answer to the most express words of God and ask, what good will it do man to be ransomed and not saved? They fear not to say that this is a thing unbeseeming God and such a weakness as men would not be guilty of, so that if we can prove that such a thing there is, they will not fear to charge it on God as his unreasonable weakness. 
Also condemned are those who, unable to reconcile two truths of Scripture, instead of holding them in tension, reject one in a vain attempt at consistency, such as those who cannot reconcile God's providence and free will and so dispense with providence, or those who cannot reconcile God's love for all men with his particular love for his elect, and so deprive God of his love for humanity. Such people, says Baxter, echo Nicodemus's incredulous response to Christ. How can these things be? To conclude with a quote from Aquinas, just as it would be the height of folly for a simple person to assert that what a philosopher proposes is false on the ground that he himself cannot understand it, so, and even more so, it is the peak of stupidity for a man to suspect as false what is divinely revealed by God simply because it cannot be investigated by reason.